The Arctic region around the North Pole is a place of unique features. Its population, its natural biodiversity, its waters and climate. This is what we learn at school in Norway. It is also a region of extremes, highly vulnerable to climate variations. Arctic landscapes and ecosystems reveal the hazardous impacts of industrial and human activities from around the globe. That is why scientists have been paying close attention to changes in the region. Changes are occurring at the surface, but the atmosphere is changing as well, revealing interesting developments. The troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, is where our weather system operates and surface temperature variations take place. It is where greenhouse gases drive the well-known phenomenon of climate change. The layer above it, the stratosphere, is also seeing change. That is where we find the ozone layer. The depletion of the ozone layer, a commonly known effect of human activity on the environment, has been putting humans and ecosystems at risk. Ozone is the Earth's natural sunscreen. So ozone depletion is you reduce the amount of ozone, you increase the amount of UV at the surface, which leads to more skin cancer, more cataracts, more sunburns, for example. In the 1980s, the discovery of the ozone hole down south over Antarctica by British and Japanese scientists triggered action from the international community to eliminate the chemical substances that destroy ozone. The Montreal Protocol has effectively stopped the production and consumption of chlorofluorocarbons and halons worldwide, making the recovery of the ozone layer foreseeable in a few decades. Until then, some of these gases will still be present in the atmosphere. These chlorofluorocarbons and halons have extremely long lifetimes, anywhere from decades to a hundred years. And so that means they're going away very slowly. So we added the hum humans added a lot of chlorine and bromine to the atmosphere and it's coming out very, very slowly. In spite of the decline of ozone depleting substances, I heard nature's alarm sounding again in 2011, but this time it was happening up north over the Arctic. With a particularly cold winter that year, the Arctic region attained record low ozone levels. I decided to investigate. I learned that over the polar regions, there are several ingredients to ozone destruction in the stratosphere. Very cold temperatures allow the formation of polar stratospheric clouds, which can activate chlorine from man-made chemicals in the atmosphere. A powerful current of air, the polar vortex, confines the chlorine chemicals over the poles where they rapidly destroy ozone molecules. These mechanisms happen differently in the Arctic and in Antarctica due to local weather dynamics and geographical conditions. In the Northern Hemisphere, because we have uh, land masses surrounding the, the Arctic Ocean, we get a much more variable meteorological uh, system. We have a kind of wave-like structure uh, in, in the winds around the, the Arctic. That leads to more variability. It leads to the pole being, on average, warmer than in the Antarctic. What was it then that made ozone levels so low over the Arctic in 2011? Not far from home, at the University of Oslo, a group of academics have been part of a network that monitors and studies the ozone layer's development over the Arctic since 1979. 2011 was a very special year with respect to ozone. We had a very uh, cold conditions in the stratosphere and we have this heterogeneous chemistry going on uh, which leads to ozone reduction and ozone hole more or less uh, and this situation lasts for a longer period than normal so the ozone re chemical ozone reduction was taking place over a longer time. The long-lasting cold winter and polar vortex seem to be at the root of the chemical destruction that year. Another thing I have learned is that we may see more of these extremely cold episodes in the stratosphere. Part of the sun's radiation is absorbed by the Earth, which warms the surface. This causes the emission of long-wave radiation back into the atmosphere. 
The increase in greenhouse gases is trapping this radiation, warming the lower atmosphere. With less radiation making its way to upper levels, the stratosphere and layers above it are cooling. Though greenhouse gases do not directly destroy the ozone, their potential effect on temperatures in the stratosphere may accentuate ozone loss. With lower temperatures in the atmosphere, especially in the polar regions, we will get more of these polar stratospheric clouds and hence more ozone depletion. Researchers also found that chemical ozone loss was not the only explanation to the low values observed in 2011. This was a work we did together with a large group of people from other countries. We were a little surprised that the, the dynamics had such a large impact on the loss we saw in 2011. Movements in the atmosphere, such as air flows and winds, are what we call atmospheric dynamics. Ozone is photochemically produced over the tropics and then transported by dynamics to higher latitudes, where it accumulates over the poles. Model simulations show that 2011 had anomalously low transport of ozone to the Arctic Pole. Scientists have concluded then that the major part of the ozone deficit was caused by changes in the dynamical transport and chemical destruction by chlorine and bromine from ozone depleting substances. If this is something which will be more regular, it will, be, uh, it will have uh, consequences, both on ecosystems and maybe also for humans. Ozone layer protection and the changing climate are topical for the Arctic Council. Founded by the eight countries that surround the North Pole, the Intergovernmental Forum keeps the region's environmental issues under careful surveillance. More than 20 additional non-Arctic countries and organizations participate as observers. Arctic ozone depletion is of global concern. A large depletion over the Arctic eventually spreads out lowering ozone levels across the entire northern hemisphere. Along the 50th parallel, where lie cities such as London, Vancouver, and Mongolia's capital, Ulaanbaatar, some of the strongest levels of UV radiation have been observed since the ozone layer has been monitored. The registered incidence of skin cancer increased several times. What happened in 2011 over the Arctic and its possible implications started to make more sense. With changing dynamics and low stratospheric temperatures affecting the ozone layer, I understood why growing scientific attention is turning to the effects of climate change on ozone distribution. And in particular in the Arctic, where snow and melting ice has been resulting in the rapid warming of the region. I decided to take a closer look at the climate change phenomenon in the Arctic, so I crossed the Arctic Circle to meet with Dr. Georg Hansen from the Norwegian Institute of Air Research. We met in Tromsø, the gateway to polar explorations in the Arctic, in a very singular scenario. It was the second wettest day ever recorded in the city. The importance of the Arctic for European weather has been, has been acknowledged for, for many, many years or decades. And, and we now realize that global climate is very much influenced by what's going on in the Arctic. And things are changing extremely fast in the Arctic. So we can expect that this will have a severe impact on, on climate and weather at mid-latitudes as well. Sharp climate variations were kept in my mind while I hit the road through the fjords of northwest Norway to check how these changes affect locals. Kurt Ludvigsen, the third generation of a fisherman family, greeted me on the island of Sommeroy. We set sail with his father, who had just turned 70 that day. These waters have been experiencing changes in temperatures, impacting also the fishing activity. The biggest changing we have realized uh, four or five last years is the mackerel that's uh, normal habitat is in uh, the North Sea is coming outside North Cape and no one has seen that before. The reason for the mackerel is coming so far north is according to the rise of the sea temperature. When I was smaller as a youngster I kind of remember it was more snow. Something happening, but uh, I can't explain it. 
In 2012, unprecedented changes in the summer sea ice cover reached a record of 2.3 million square meters, 18% below the average in the 1980s and 90s. At one point, 97% of Greenland's surface ice sheet was melting. Every summer, a group of students from the University of South Bohemia in the Czech Republic takes an expedition to the Norwegian island of Svalbard at the heart of the Arctic, where they study the impacts of climate change on polar ecology. Arctic landscapes on Svalbard retain ecosystems close to what was found in the Czech Republic 10 to 12,000 years ago in the most southern tundra of Europe. An environmental imbalance in the Arctic can have a larger impact than only in the Arctic. It can also have a global impact. We have faced a very large temperature increase in the Arctic, larger than elsewhere, and this can have a dynamic impact on the weather systems and the transport in the atmosphere. Another major concern lies in the Arctic's frozen soil, called the permafrost. When permafrost melts, it releases carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and methane. The warming of the region could drastically increase emissions of these powerful greenhouse gases. Global warming is impacting the surface and with it, changing the atmosphere. Well aware of the rapid changes taking place in that part of the world, I decided to follow Dr. Hansen to Andoya. On this island in northern Norway can be found the Alomar Atmospheric Observatory where the study of the ozone layer seems crucial to our understanding of the atmosphere's behavior. Researchers from all over the world uh, come here to, uh, to this location to do measurements of the atmosphere. We measure temperature, wind speeds, turbulence, uh, amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, ozone content, and connect these things together to get a full view of what's going on with the complex system that is the atmosphere. Recovery of the ozone layer is predicted by models. The predictions that the models have made, they need to be verified. These models are not necessarily uh, taking into account that the climate is changing rapidly. Having this combined effect of atmospheric chemistry influencing ozone and the whole atmosphere composition and dynamics changing due to climate change, that may give us very different results from what these uh, focused models on, on ozone recovery might give us. To stop the monitoring now would not be a very good idea because we need to make sure that we uh, are on the right track. The complete recovery of the ozone layer is expected to achieve later this century. I think we need to monitor the ozone layer at least until then to ensure the effectiveness of the Montreal Protocol. Since the beginning of its activities 26 years ago, the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer has had a direct positive impact on the climate system. The Montreal Protocol reduced the amount of chlorofluorocarbons, which are potent greenhouse gases. In addition to helping the ozone layer, it really greatly helped the climate change issue. Recent discussions about curbing the use of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, used as substitutes for ozone-depleting substances in refrigeration appliances, also point in the right direction. It is a greenhouse gas uh, in the same way as CO2 and methane and so on. So if we get too much HFCs in the atmosphere, that will have a, a global warming effect. So for that reason, we should try and, uh, and phase out also the HFCs. There is a major concern that the increasing presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere could backlash particularly if substitutes for ozone-depleting substances are powerful greenhouse gases. This understanding has also led to a growing consensus that climate and ozone studies should be coupled. We definitely should couple these studies because there are feedback from one to the others. 
the ozone will have an effect on, on the climate and climate will have an effect on ozone distribution. We are trying to see if we are able to understand all the changes from all different kind of processes because we want to have a healthy atmosphere which is developing in a way that is sustainable for, for human and ecosystems. What, what people uh, often do not realize is that the ozone layer is a very special feature of, of the Earth's atmosphere. And it heats up the atmosphere and that makes the atmosphere much more stable than, for example, on Venus or on Mars. Without ozone, we wouldn't have a stratosphere. We just would have an extremely uh, dynamic system with thunderstorms, maybe uh, raising up to 30, 40 kilometers in altitude, and that would be a very unpleasant world to live in. As I head back home after this investigation, I feel that science is on our side and that we are on the right track to keeping our atmosphere healthy. But change is happening rapidly. Mobilization and action are still needed in order to ensure the ozone layer's recovery. It stabilizes our climate regime. It protects life on Earth. <laughs> <laughs>